Ashley Brock reading Nora Roberts' book, Inner Harbor, Chapter 3. The typical venue for socializing, information gathering, and mating ritual, small town or big city, said Bill observed, was the local bar. Whether it was decorated with brass and ferns or peanut shells and tiny ashtrays, whether the music was whiny country or heart-reeling rock, it was the traditional spot for gathering and exchanging information. Shawnee's Pub in St. Christopher certainly fit the bill. The decor here was dark wood, cheap chrome, and faded posters of boats. The music was loud, she decided on unable to fully identify the style booming out of the towering amps flanking the small stage where four young men pounded away at guitars and drums with more enthusiasm than talent. Trio men at the bar kept their eyes glued to the baseball game on a small screen TV bracketed to the wall behind the bar. They seemed content to watch the silent ballots of pitcher and batter while they nursed brown bottles of beer and ate fistfuls of pretzels. The dance floor was jammed. There were only four couples, but the limited space caused several incidents of elbow wrapping and hip bumping. No one seemed to mind. The witches were decked out in foolish male fantasy outfits, short black skirts, Tiny, tight V-neck blouses, fishnet stockings, and stiletto heels. Sibyl felt instant sympathy. She tucked herself into a wobbling table as far away from the amps as humanly possible. The smoke and noise didn't bother her, nor did the sticky floor or the jittery table. Her choice of sitting, seating afforded her the clearest view of the occupants. She'd been desperate to escape her hotel room for a couple of hours. Now she was set to sit back, enjoy a glass of wine, and observe the natives. The waitress, who appeared was a petite brunette with an envi enviable bust line and a cherry wine. Hi, what can I get you? A glass of Chardonnay and a side of ice. Coming right up. She set a black plastic bowl filled with pretzels on the table and picked her way back to the bar, taking orders as she went. Sibyl wondered if she just had her first encounter with Ethan's wife. Her information was that Grace Quinn worked at this bar, but there had been no wedding ring on the little brunette's finger. Sibyl assumed that a new bride would certainly wear one. The other waitress, the one looked dangerous, she decided, blonde, built, and brooding. She was certainly attractive in an obvious way. Still nothing about her shouted newly wet either, particularly the way she leaned over an appropriate customer's table to give him the full benefit of her cleavage. Sophia frowned and nibbled on a pretzel. If that was Grace Quinn, she would definitely be scratched from mother figure status. Something happened in the ball game, she Bill assumed, as the three men began to shout, cheering on somebody named Eddie. Out of habit, she took out her notebook and began to record observations. The, blacks, the back slapping, the arm punching of male companions, the body language of the females leaning in for intimacy, the hair flipping, the eye shifting, hand gesturing, and of course, the mating ritual of the contemporary couple through the dance. That was how Philip saw her when he came in. She was smiling to herself, her gaze moving, her hands scribbling. She looked, he thought, very cool, very remote. She might have been behind us in a sheet of one-way glass. She pulled her hair back so that it lay in sleek tail on her neck and left her face unframed. God drops studded. <laughs> Gold drop studded with a single colored stone swung at her ears. She watched he watched her put her pin down to shrug out of a sweet jacket of pale yellow. He had driven in on impulse, given in to restlessness. Now he blessed the vaguely dissatisfied mood that had dogged him all evening. She was, he decided, exactly what he'd been looking for. Sibyl, right? He saw the quick surprise look in her eyes when she glanced up, and he saw that those eyes were as clear and pure as lake water. <laughs> That's right. Recovering, she closed her notebook and smiled. Philip, of Boats by Quinn. You're here alone? Yes, unless you like to sit down and have a drink. I'd love to. He pulled out a chair, nodded toward the notebook. Did I interrupt you? Not really. She shifted her smile to the waitress. When her wine, wine was served. Hey, Phil, want to drive? Marcia, you read my mind. Marcia, Sibyl thought. That eliminated the perky brunette. It's unusual mu music. The music here constant, consistently sucks. He flashed a smile. Quick, charming and music. It's a tradition. Here's to tradition, then. She lifted her glass, sipped with a little hmm, began transferring ice into the wine. How would you rate the wine? Well, it's basic, elemental, primitive. She sipped again, smiled winningly. It sucks. <laughs> That's also a proud Chinese tradition. He's got Sam Adams on draft. It's a better bet. I'll remember that. Lips curved, she tilted her head. Since you know the local traditions, I take it you lived here for some time. Yeah. His eyes narrowed. He stuttered her. As something pushed at the edges of his memory. I know you.
Her heart pounded hard in her throat, taking her time. She picked up her glass again. Her hand remained steady, her voice even and even and easy. I don't think so. No, I do. I know that face. It didn't click before when you were wearing sunglasses. Something about he reached out, put a hand under her chin, and angled her head again. That look right there. His fingertips were just a bit rough. His touch very confident and firm. The gesture itself warned her that this was a man used to touching women, and she was a woman unused to being touched. A defensive male arched an eyebrow. A woman with a cynical beat would suspect that's a line and not a very original one. I don't use lines, he murmured, concentrating on her face. Except originals. I'm good with images. I've seen that one. Clear, intelligent eyes, slightly amused smile. Sabil. His gaze skimmed over her face, and his lips curved slowly. Griffin. Dr. Sabil Griffin. Familiar strangers. She let out the breath that had clogged in her lungs. Their success, success was still very new, and having her face recognized continued to surprise her. And in this case, relieve her. There's no connection between Dr. Griffin and Seth Tillotner. You are good, she said lightly. So, did you read the book or just look at my picture on the dust jacket? I read it. Fascinating stuff. In fact, I like it enough to go out and buy your first one. Haven't read it yet, though. I'm flattered. You're good. Thanks, Marcia. He added when she set his beer in front of him. Y'all just holler if you need anything else. Marcia winked. Holler loud. The band's breaking sound records tonight. Which gave him an excuse to edge his chair closer and lean in. Her scent was subtle, he noted. A man had to get very close to catch its message. Tell me, Dr. Griffin, what's a renowned urbanite doing in an unapologetic rural water town like St. Chris? Research, behavioral patterns, and traditions, she said, lifting her glass and a half toast, of small towns and royal c communities. Quite a change of pace for you. Soci sociology and cultural interests aren't and shouldn't be limited to cities. Taking notes, a few. The local tavern, she began more comfortable now. The regulars, the trio at the bar, observed with their ritual of male-dominated sports to the exclusive of the noise and activities around them. They could be home, kicked back in their barker loungers, but they prefer the bonding experience of passive participation in the event. In this way, they have companionship partners with whom to share the interests, who will either argue or agree. Doesn't matter which, it's the pattern that matters that matters. He found her he found he enjoyed the way her voice took on a lecturing tone that brought out brisk Yankee. The O's are in a hot pennant race, and you're deep in Orioles territory. Maybe it's the game. The game is the vehicle. The pattern would remain fairly consistent whether the vehicle was football or baseball, she shrugged. Typical male gains more entertainment more enjoyment from sports if he has at least one like minded male companion with him. You have only to observe commercials aimed primarily at the male consumer. Beer, for instance, she said, tapping a finger on his glass. It's quite often sold by showcasing a group of attractive men sharing some common experience. A man then buys that brand of beer because he's been programmed to believe that it will enhance his standing with his peer group. Because he was grinning, she lifted her eyebrows. You disagree? Not at all. I'm in advertising, and that pretty much hits the nail. Advertising? She ignored the little tug of guilt at the pretense. I wouldn't think there would be much call for that here. I work in Baltimore. I'm back here on weekends for a while. Family thing. Long story. I'd like to hear it. Later. Or something he thought about those nearly translucent blue eyes framed by long, inky lashes that made it nearly impossible to look anywhere else. Tell me what else you see. Well... The fine skill she decided a master work the way he could look at a woman as if she were the most vital thing in the world at that one moment made her heart bump pleasantly. You see the other waitress? Philip glanced over, watched the frivolous bow on the back of the woman's skirt swirl as she walked along over to miss her. Yes, she fulfills cr certain permit primitive and typical male fantasies requirements, but I'm referring to the personality, not physicality. Okay. Phil ran his tongue around. What do you see? She's efficient, but she's already calculating the time until closing. She knows how to size up the better tippers and play to them. She all but ignores the table of college students there. They won't add much to her bill. You see the same survival techniques from an experienced and cynical waitresses in New York bar. In a New York bar. 
Linda Brewster, Philip supplied, recently divorced on the prowl for a new and improved husband. Her family owns a pizza place, so she's been waitressing off and on for years. Doesn't care for it. Do you want to dance? What? Then that's not Grace either. She's not sure we'll tune back in. I'm sorry. The band slowed it down if they haven't turned it down. Would you like to dance? All right. She let him take her hand to lead her through the tables to the dance floor, where they shoehorn themselves into the crowd. I think this is supposed to be a version of Andy. Angie, Philip murmured. If Mick and the boys heard what they're doing to it, they'd shoot the entire band on sight. You like the stones? What's not to like? Since they could do no more than sway, she tilted her head back to look at him. It wasn't a hardship to find his face so close to hers, where before she pressed her body firmly to his down and dirty, rock and roll, no frills, no fuss, all sex. You like sex? She had to laugh. What's not to like? And though I appreciate the thought, I don't intend to have any tonight. There's always tomorrow. There certainly is. She considered kissing him, letting him kiss her, as an experiment that would certainly include an aspect of enjoyment. Instead, she turned her head so his cheeks brushed. <laughs> he was entirely too attractive for an impulse and uncalculated risk. Better safe, she reminded herself, than stupid. <laughs> Why don't I take you to dinner tomorrow? Skillfully, he slid a hand up her spine, back down her waist. There's a nice place right in the town. Terrific view of the bay. Best seafood on the shore. We can have a conversation in normal tones, and you can tell me the story of your life. His lips had brushed her ear, sending a shotgun ripple of reaction down to her toes. She should have known. She thought that anyone who looked like he did would be damn good at sexual maneuvers. I'll think about it, she murmured and decided to give as good as she got. Skimmed her fingertips over the back of his neck. And that you know. When the song ended and the next picked up at a blast of sound and speed, she's went, I have to go. What? And he leaned out of shoe shoe on his ear. I have to go. Thanks for the dance. I'll walk you out. Back at the table, we pulled out some bills while she gathered her things. The first step outside into the cool and quiet air made her laugh. Well, that was an experience. Thank you for adding to it. I wouldn't have missed it. It's not very late. He had it taken her hand. Late enough, she pulled out the keys of her car. Come by the boatyard tomorrow. I'll show you around. I might just do that. Good night, Phil. So, Bill, he didn't bother to resist. Simply brought her hand to his lips. Over their joined fingers, his eyes like, I'm glad you picked St. Chris. So am I. She slipped into her car, believed that she had to concentrate on the task of switching on the lights, releasing the brake, starting the engine. Driving was not second nature to a woman who had depended on public transportation or private car services most of her life. She focused on reversing and putting the car in drive to make the turn onto the road, and she finally ignored the faint echo of pressure pressure on her knuckles where his lips had touched but she didn't quite resist glancing in the rearview mirror and taking one last look at him before she drove away philip decided that going back in the shiners would be absurdly anticlimactic he thought about her as he drove home the way her eyebrows arched when she made a point or enjoyed a comment that subtle and intimate scent she wore that told a man that if he gotten close enough to catch it with maybe just maybe he'd have a chance to get closer told himself she was the perfect woman for him to invest some time in getting closer to. She was beautiful, she was smart, she was cultured and sophisticated, and just sexy enough to make his hormones stand at attention. He liked women and missed having time for conversation with them. Not that he didn't enjoy talking with Anna and Grace, but let's face it, it wasn't quite the same as talking with a woman when you could also fantasize, fantasize about taking her to bed. <laughs> And he'd been missing that particular area of male-female relationships just lately. He'd rarely have time to do more than stumble into his apartment after 10 or 12 hour workday. His once interesting and variety social calendar had taken some large hits since sets had come to the family. The week was dedicated to his accounts and consultations with the lawyer. The fight with the insurance company on payment of his father's death benefits was coming to a head. The resolution of permanent guardianship of sets would be decided within 90 days. The response the responsibility of dealing with the mountain of paperwork and phone calls that sprang from those actions was his. Details were his strong point. Weekends were consumed by household duties, the business, and whatever had slipped through the cracks during the week. When he added it all up, he mused, it didn't leave much time for cozy dinners with attractive women, much less the ritual of slipping between the sheets with those women. Which explained his recent restlessness and moodiness, he supposed. When a man's sex life virtually vanished, he was bound to get a little edgy.
The house was dark for the single beam of the porch light when he pulled into the drive, barely midnight on Friday night. He thought with a sigh, how the mighty had fallen. There would have been a time when he and his brothers would be, would have been out cruising, looking for action. Well, he and Cam would have tracked Ethan along, but once they hauled down to the men to it, Ethan would have held up his end. The Quinn boys hadn't spent many Friday nights snoozing. These days, he thought as he climbed out of the jeep, Cam would be upstairs cozied up to his wife, and Ethan would be tucked into Grace's little house. Undoubtedly, they both had smiles on their faces. Lucky bastards! Nobody wouldn't be able to sleep. He skirted the house, walked to where the edge of the trees met the edge of the water. The moon was fat ball riding the night sky. It shed its soft white light over the dark water, wet air grass, and thick leaves. Cicadas were singing in their high, monotonous voices, and deep in those thick woods, an owl called out in tireless two-tone notes. Perhaps he preferred the sound of the city's voices and traffic muffled through glass, but he never failed to find this spot appealing. Though he missed the city's pace, the theater, museums, the electrical mix of food and people, he could appreciate the peace and the stability he found right here day after day, year after year. Without it, he had no doubt he would have found his way back to the gutter and died there. You always wanted more for yourself than that. Chill washed through him from gut to fingertips where he had been standing. Stared out on the moonlight, showering through the trees. He was now staring at his father, the father he buried six months ago. I only had one berry, he heard himself say. He aren't drunk, son. Ray stepped forward so that the moonlight shimmered over his dramatic mane of silver hair and into the brilliant blue eyes that were bright with him. You're going to want to breathe now before you pass out. Phil put out his breath in a whoosh, but his ears continued to ring. I'm going to sit down now. He did slowly, like a creaky old man, easing himself down on the grass. I don't believe in ghosts, he said to the water. we we'll reincarnations, the afterlife, visitations, or any form of psychic phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> you always you always were the most pragmatic of the lot. Nothing was real unless you could say, touch it, smell it. Ray sat beside him with a content sigh, stretched out long legs clad in frayed jeans. He crossed his angels and on his feet were the well worn dock sides that Philip himself had picked into a box packed into a box for the Salvation Army nearly six months before. Well, Ray said cheerfully, You're saying me, aren't you? No. I'm having an episode, most likely resulting from sexual deprivation and overwork. I won't argue with that. Still pretty at night. I haven't reached closure yet. Phil said, no, I'm still angry over the way he died. And why? And all the unanswered questions. So I'm projecting. <laughs> I figured you'd be the toughest nut of the three. I have had an answer for everything. I know you've got questions, too, and I know you've got anger. You're entitled. You have to change your life and take on responsibilities that shouldn't have been yours. But you did it, and I'm grateful. I don't have time for therapy right now. There's no place on the schedule to fit in sessions in it. Hey, let out a hoodle out there. Boy, you're not drunk, and you're not crazy either. You're just stubborn. Why don't you use that flexible mind of yours, Philip, and consider it a possibility? Bracing himself, Philip turned his head. It was his father's face, wide and lined with life and filled with humor. Those bright blue eyes were dancing. The silver hair ruffled in the night air. This is an imp this is an impossibility. Some people said when your mother and I took you and your brothers in that it was an impossibility. We'd make a family, make a difference. They were wrong. If we'd listened to them, if we'd gone by logic, none of you would have been ours. But fate doesn't give a horse's ass about logic. It just is. And you meant, and you were meant to be ours. Okay. Phil shot out a hand and jerked it back and shot. How could I do that? How could I touch you if you're a ghost? Because you need it too. Casually Ray gave Phil's shoulder a quick pat. I'm here for the next little while. Phil's throat filled, even in his stomach tightened up. Why? I didn't finish. I left it up to you and your brothers. I'm sorry for that, Philip. Wasn't happening, of course. Phil told himself he was probably in the first stages of a minor breakdown. He should he could feel the air against his face warm and moist. The gators were still shrilling, the owl still hooting. If he was having an episode he thought again it seemed only right to play it out. They're trying to say it was suicide, he said so. The insurance company's fighting the claim. I hope you know, I hope you know that's bullshit. I was careless, distracted. I had an accident. 
there was an ancient race for snail. Impatient as noise, I feel recognized. I wouldn't have taken the easy way, and I had the boy to think about. It says your son. I can tell you that it belongs to me. Pulls his head in his heartache as he turned to stare at the water again. <laughs> Mom was still alive when he was conceived. I know that. I was never unfaithful to your mother. Then how? You need to accept him for himself. I know you care for him. I know you're doing your best by him. You have the last step to take acceptance. He needs you. All of you. Nothing's going to happen to him, Phil Segrum. We'll see to that. <laughs> He'll change your life if you let him. Bill Bledos will believe me, he already has. In a way that will make your life better. Don't close yourself off to those possibilities and don't worry too much about this little visit. <laughs> he patted him completely on the talk to your brothers. Yeah, like I'm gonna tell them I sat outside in the middle of the night and talked to he looked over, so does and put the moonlight on the trees. Nobody? He finished and wearily laid down on the grass, stared at the moon. God I need a vacation. <laughs> End of chapter three.